round of applause. But could you also please give a round of applause for our musician tonight, Soto. <laughs> I'm Paul Webley, I'm the director of SOAS. I'd like to welcome you all uh, in the audience tonight, particularly those who have traveled a long way to be here, and Professor Khalili's friends, colleagues, and family. I don't quite know where your family are. But they're over here. But anyway, I was told this is the first time uh, that you've heard your mother speak academically. I can assure you it'll be brilliant, and it won't be boring, okay? We've got guests from uh, many institutions here tonight some of whom have travelled a very long way to be here, a very long way indeed. Uh, and we really appreciate all of you uh, taking the trouble. It all adds to the occasion that is a SOAS inaugural. This has a wonderful feel to it. I could tell that when I was just waiting outside. It's great. It's a ceremony. It's a reckless passage. It's a celebration, I think, above all. But it's also an enjoyable intellectual event for the whole of the SOAS community. Now, just to make sure that it is an enjoyable event, I do need to just do some simple housekeeping. So, turn off your mobile phones if you've not already done so. And do note where the fire exits are. Having said that, I can't even see them myself, but they're there, there, and there, and there. And if the fire alarms go off, don't panic and do leave. We don't organise fire drills at 6.45 or 7 o'clock in the evening. I'm very pleased to preside over this inaugural lecture. It's the seventh of this year's uh, inaugural lecture series. Professor Khalili made a very strong impression on me, she probably doesn't realise this, when I was interviewed for the position of uh, Director of SOAS about nine years ago. She was on one of the interview panels, there were four separate panels grilling me, um, and she asked me for my views on freedom of speech. She was very direct and very good. Uh, I've continued to be impressed ever since. She's a brilliant scholar. She's a great citizen of SOAS, but I have never, ever heard her talk at lecture length about her research. So I'm really looking forward to that this evening. That's going to be great. Professor Cleely will be introduced by Professor Claire Hemmings. Professor Hemmings is a professor of feminist theory and has worked at LSE's Gender Institute for 15 years. Her main research contributions are in the field of transnational gender and sexuality studies. She's particularly interested in thinking through the relationship between feminist theory and sexuality studies, as well as the ways in which both fields have been institutionalised at national and international levels. Professor Hemmings and Professor Cleely were together as part of the Feminist Review Collective. They're fellow travellers, politically, ethically, and although their works only occasionally intersect, they look at the world through very similar eyes. And I'm told that she's the closest friend of Professor Cleely in London. And I love that. So... An academic, a great academic, also a great academic friend. So thank you so much for that. Dr. Lisa Hajar will be delivering the vote of thanks. Now, she's a professor of sociology at the uh, University of California, Santa Barbara. And this year, she became the Edward Said Chair of American Studies at the American University of Beirut. And where has she travelled from to be here with us tonight? From Beirut. We all of us really appreciate that. It's great of you to come. Um, her research and writing focuses on law and legality, war and conflict, human rights and torture... She serves on the editorial committees of Middle East Report and the Journal of Palestine, Palestine Studies. She's currently working on a book about anti-torture lawyering in the United States. Professor Hajar and Professor Khalili appear to share what appears to me to be an unhealthy love of really grim topics. <laughs> they might be lovely people, but drones, war, torture. Uh, anyway, Lise, this is what... Uh, Professor Cleely says, Lisa is a kind of intellectual soulmate. We both share a great deal of politics too. We're both very grateful to, to both of you to being here tonight, to making this event the very special event it's going to be. Thank you so much for coming. Now, at the end, there'll be a vote of thanks. Sometimes people stare around looking at each other saying, what do we do now then? Okay, so after the vote of thanks, then you go upstairs for a reception and canapes, okay? So you don't have to rush, but that's what you have to do at the end. So... To introduce Professor Cleely, I'll now pass over to Professor Hemmings. Over to you. We discovered upstairs that these robes are not made for women. <laughs> so they're... <laughs> 
So eventually Eden Ravenscroft will actually have to redesign their robes, hopefully sooner rather than later. It's such an enormous pleasure and quite a responsibility, I'm sure you'll agree, to introduce uh, Professor Lale Kalili. Um, and it's hugely appropriate, I think, that so many of you have shown up this evening to show your uh, love and respect for her. Um, I first met Lale in a Soho restaurant in 2006, where the Feminist Review Collective went to enjoy dinner, say goodbye to old friends and welcome new members to the journal. We arrived a bit exhausted and fed up with one another but were greeted with smiles and enthusiasm by an early arriving Lale, one of the new members. As we grunted and collapsed in so many small heaps, Lale realized she was not going to get anywhere until we were refreshed and so took charge, ordering bubbles and nibbles, <laughs> chivying us to the table and effectively hosting us until we recuperated. Now I think back on that, that might have been the moment that we decided that she would be the perfect treasurer of the journal. <laughs> I was lucky enough to sit next to Lale that night and was drawn into the orbit of this remarkable woman who has become such a treasured friend. Within four hours, we had shared our own trajectories through intellectual and geographical locations. I think mine took a couple of minutes, yours took a somewhat longer. <clears throat> expressed enthusiasm and disgust for various kinds of food and ways of preparing them, established a common socialist feminist analysis of various political and cultural concerns within Scotland, the US, Australia and Palestine, argued quite fervently about same-sex civil unions and whether these confirmed or open up, opened up the status quo, mercilessly mocked people who believe in work-life balance, <laughs> named our relationships past and present as well as common friends, talked about Lale's decision to have May, her beautiful daughter, uh, and my decision not to have uh, any children, and laughed and laughed and laughed on the 73 bus back to North East London. And by the time I got home, re-energised from having stolen some of Lale's sparkle, I could barely remember what a London life without Lale in it felt like. You will all, I think, recognize the Lale of this brief anecdote as resonant with the Lale whose intellectual achievements we have come to celebrate this evening. For me, I learned two primary things about her that night that have remained true. First, I caught a glimpse of Lale's deep intellectual life, underwritten by the real political and ethical commitments that drive and sustain her. And second, I already felt galvanized by the extraordinary energy that she brings to that life and to those commitments. Lale's intellectual contributions will be well known by most of you here, and let me remind you of some of them. Her first book, Heroes and Martyrs of Palestine, The Politics of National Commemoration, published by Cambridge in 2007, drew on her PhD research at Columbia University in political science, where she worked with the late Professor Charles Tilley. Her second monograph, Time in the Shadows, Confinement in Counterinsurgencies, published by Stanford in 2013, was the winner of the Susan Strange Best Book Prize of the British International Studies Association and the 2014 Best Book Award of the International Political Sociology Section of the ISA. Both books combine empirical research, the first through detailed ethnography in the refugee camps in Le Lebanon, the second through interviews with former detainees of Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo, and Israeli detention camps and prisons, but also with military officers, guards, and interrogators. She combines that with detailed archival and theoretical work to bring alive for the reader the complex political contexts Lale intervenes in. She is also the editor of Modern Arab Politics, 2008, and co-editor uh, with Gillian uh, Schwedler of Policing and Prisons in the Middle East, Formations of Coercion, from 2010. As part of her immense work on Feminist Review, Lale has co-edited two special issues, War with Pam Aldred and Amal Treacher, in 2008, and Water with Rutvitsa Andriesevich in 2013. 
She is also the author of more than 30 journal articles and book chapters on both areas you would expect that, that she covers in her research, but also on additional areas of ethics of social science research, gender, memory and nation, and the uses of happiness and pleasure for good and evil. Despite these amazing accomplishments, Lale did not always expect to be a political scientist. She received her BSc in chemical engineering from the University of Texas in 1991, and she spent some years working as a management consultant before moving on to graduate study. Lale herself tends to speak of these as distinct phases in her life, but as a theorist of narrative, I prefer to draw out the unexpected continuities. In consulting, Lale will have honed her natural skills at engaging people and learned how to get people to tell her things whether they wanted to or not. <laughs> Much as she must have got military officers to tell her things they wouldn't tell most of us. And I suspect too that she will have learned to be suspicious of trends, knowing that the next great thing is just around the corner, and thus learn not to value a theory for its shiny veneer, but for what it may or may not help us do. Perhaps for a longer time, the relevance of chemical engineering might have been a bit more obscure, but now that Lale is uh, knee-deep into her ESRC-funded project on military logistics and ports, this knowledge must surely be coming in a little more handy. When I think of Lale, I think of movement. Born in Iran and moving to and through Australia, the US, Scotland and England, Lale is a mobile thinker in lots of different ways. Not only does she travel for work and for pleasure, not necessarily separate, of course, back and forth, back and forth to Lebanon, Dubai, Malta, Belgium, France, Spain, Syria, Palestine, and the US, to name but a small handful, um, Lale also crosses disciplinary and political borders in her research. This intellectual and literal mobility enables her to cross-fertilize ideas and histories and makes her restless for a truth under the noise and hubbub of perpetual motion. I say this not to glamorize exile or migration, but to speak of Lale's tenacity in recognizing, but also moving across boundaries and borders in her work and in all her engagements with others. Lale throws herself, body and soul, into the thick of her research sites, setting up blogs, posting political journalism and poems, uh, and recently, of course, traveling on a container ship while reading classic maritime novels, as well as writing her exemplary academic texts. In all her work, which returns us to and will not let us ignore the violence and degradation that characterize global power relations, Lale also seeks to develop an ethics of connection and representation tracing threads of human value and pleasure that constitute lifelines to sustain those on the edges of society and of political community. I think this is one of the reasons why Lali is such an amazing role model for her colleagues and students, that she exemplifies the engaged researcher we would all like to be, a real intellectual, and never leaves us mired in devastation. Violence will constrain and decimate people's lives, but so too we will find ourselves, quote, cycling on the corniche and swimming in the sea, unquote. As the subtitle of Lale's AHRC-funded project, Politics of Pleasure in Lebanon, reminds us. If you go online and Google Lale Khalili images, which I recommend, <laughs> which I did before this inaugural, you will see a sequence of photos of Lale in action. Her staff page and Facebook page see her talking animatedly, probably to one of her myriad PhD students, hands in motion so that they remain blurred in front of her, emphasizing her point, looking in concentration at her interlocutor, clearly in her element. In another, you see Lale looking quizzically at another speaker outside the frame, or in another, smiling at the camera drinking a mint tea insisting on her point at the podium, or hugging a friend and colleague. In these images, in her writing, and in our celebration of Lale's professorship, we are witnessing a friend and colleague who finds herself in exactly the right place. Congratulations, Professor Khalili.
everyone. I'm going to be fiddling with this robe, so I'm just going to wear it in a jaunty way. Okay. First, the Oscar speech. Um, I'd like to first say I'm incredibly pleased that given that Paul is stepping down in September, I'm so incredibly happy that he presided over these events. Um, you have brought incredible grace and energy to situations which have been incredibly hard, and I'm incredibly grateful that you're here. Please, everybody, <laughs> applause for Paul. I'm unbelievably moved by Claire's introduction, and I think it was very excessive. And um, the only reason I'm not weeping is because I'm wearing liquid eyeliner, which my daughter <laughs> wanted to wear. But um, what pleasure it is to have Claire and Lisa introduce me and give the vote of thanks, to have people that you love also be the people whose work and brilliance you respect, and you feel your fellow travelers and intellectual soulmates. So thank you very much to my lovely BFFs for being here for me tonight. It's also pretty kick-ass to have three really, really energetic women professors on the days. So... I'd like to acknowledge my beautiful kids, May and Pablo, who are going to be bored out of their minds, I'm sure. But they're going to be here. It's just an hour. I didn't let you bring your gadgets in, so just see if you can bear it for a bit. And all the friends who are here, I'm so grateful to you for having been here, for being here now, and for having been here for me for years. And I'm especially happy to see loads of my colleagues from my department and from across SOAS here. One of the things about working in this place is the collegiality, the unfailing solidarity, the intellectual brilliance, the sense of reciprocity, humor, and profound ability to party are all surely envied by anyone else working in other universities here. Uh, I'm very happy to, and moved to see so many of my former and current students here in the audience. You make my life as a teacher a joy, your intellectual curiosity, your boundless enthusiasm, your belief in the power of political mobilization, this is SOAS after all, your total absence of cynicism. Teaching you is still a privilege and a joy at a time when universities seem so rapidly to be transforming into enterprises made for profit and customer service, where our customers are government and businesses. So thank you for being you and for making SOAS the extraordinary place that it is. Last but not least, I want to thank the amazing colleagues who have organized the evening quietly and behind the scenes and so unbelievably efficiently. Payal Galgani, Eleanor Massey, Tom and Katie, uh, our colleagues in design, Jerry um, in audiovisual, Glenn who's taking photographs, and our colleagues in catering and cleaners who will clean up afterwards, who are putting the food up, up upstairs, who've made this evening possible. So thank you to all of you as well. <laughs> And so now to the lecture. Call me Ishmael. Um, I'm only being half facetious. Those of you, know, those of you who know me well uh, know that for the last two years I've been interminably, perhaps like mind-numbingly, speaking about Herman Melville. In fact, people have been taking bets about whether or not I'll bring up Melville tonight, so go on ahead, exchange money. <laughs> and especially about Moby Dick, with my obsession with the book serendipitously coinciding with my fixation with all things maritime, ports, and transport related. Edward Said introduced Moby Dick as one of the finest works of fiction, with daring aesthetic beauty and terrifying intensity. In the 1950s, while interned in an immigration, de the immigration detention center at Ellis Islands in New York, the great Trinidadian theorist, thinker, historian, and revolutionary C.L.R. James wrote an entire book about Moby Dick in which he described this unwieldy, beautiful, hilarious, profound book as the ultimate narrative of a seafaring proletarian international. I also begin with Melville and with Moby Dick, which many have called an allegory of American imperial power, because some of this story which I, will tilt, which I will tell today will be impossible to tell if one remains within the bounds of the geographical area that graces my title, the Middle East. <laughs> 
Melville, in a sense, anticipates the global geography of commerce and trade. And even as Britain ruled the waves, also foresees an American century whose contours have been defined by naval conquest and commercial expansion. Melville also tells the story of what is today called globalization, a really far too baggy a phrase denoting the kinds of global movements of goods, raw materials, product and, products and people which Melville wrote about, with almost all of his novels taking place at sea, where boundaries are less clear, national belongings far more provisional, and the rigid hierarchies that characterize shipboard discipline are always fragile and subject to the consent or refusal of those at sea. And the sea is also where, despite these blurrings, power always resided in a metropole that had enough capital to be able to afford to send forth ships upon the deep. I begin with Moby Dick also because Melville recognized so brilliantly the traffic between war and trade and the sea routes which both navies and merchant mariners traversed in their conquest of the world. He wrote perceptibly and with an ironic twist that, and I quote, if American and European men of war, warships, now peacefully ride in once savage harbors, let them fire salutes to the honor and glory of the whale ship, which originally showed them the way and first interpreted between them and the savages, end quote. Notwithstanding the language that bears the mark of both his sarcasm and its time, Melville had no illusions about the expansionist politics of whaling or that warships followed whale ships in bloodily laying claim to distant lands and distant seas. Melville's many brilliant nautical novels trace the maritime routes via which far corners of the world are woven together and distant shores are incorporated into a network of production, pillage, trade and conquest. Viewing a map of, uh, so, so if you look at that US whaling ship, all of the blue lines were the whalers going around the world. It's an extraordinary image uh, produced by uh, a um, big data person. <laughs> Who does really interesting work, actually. <laughs> Viewing a map of maritime trade of whaling ships and other, um, sorry, other merchant marine covering the surface of the seas and connecting continents, one becomes intensely aware of how those cartographies of trade were coextensive with subsequent geopolitical ambitions of the US. Perhaps the most influential, I mean, look at this. Uh, you can see the Philippines, you can see the Hawaii Islands, which were annexed, you can see uh, colonization, places that the US actually directly colonized on this map. Perhaps the most influential advocate of this geopolitics of conquest at the end of the 19th century was Alfred Thayer Mahan, whose influence, the influence of sea power upon history argues that the primacy of sea power is a means of securing commercial advantage worldwide. Mahan writes, the profound influence of sea commerce upon the wealth and strength of countries was clearly seen long before the true principles which governed its growth and prosperity were detected. To secure to one's own people a disproportionate share of such benefits, every effort was made to exclude others, either by the peaceful legislative methods of monopoly or prohibitory regulations, or when these failed, by direct violence. The U.S. annexation of the Hawaiian Islands, its colonization of the Philippines and Caribbean Islands, including what is now today Guantanamo Bay, a section of Cuba, and today's pivot to Asia also contain echoes of Mahan's admonishments. These maps have to be understood as maps both of geostrategic naval expansion and of commercial ambitions of a fast industrializing nation seeking markets overseas and secure trade routes and geostrategic anchors in various corners of the world. Today, the commercial ships traversing the sea are no longer whalers, but include container ships, oil and chemical tankers, and bulk carriers. It is worth noting the extent to which these cobwebbed seas tell us about how the world economy still depends not on the virtual or fictive, or not only on the virtual and fictive, but on the stubbornly material and concrete. <laughs> 
Speed is so valued today in its various guises as efficiency, as packets of data traveling wirelessly or through cable connections, as quicker delivery time, as higher productivity and shorter communication time. But speed is still not necessarily a characteristic of the vast majority of the world's goods traveling at seas. As the great theorist and photographer of seaborne labor and trade, Alan Sekular wrote, large-scale material flows remain intractable. Acceleration is not absolute. The hydrodynamics of large capacity hulls and the power output of diesel engines set a limit to the speed of cargo ships not far beyond that of the first quarter of the 20th century. It still takes about eight days to cross the Atlantic and about 12 to cross the Pacific. Further, although living in London, which is the banking center of the world, makes us think that the most, that most value produced is in fictive commodities, speculated futures, money moving or being forged literally or sometimes through manipulation of LIBOR, financialization and various other instruments and the transmission of value through ether, in fact, Traveling through ports will tell you that things, many things, most things, are still concrete, solid, earthbound, dense. Of the material that is carried in the largest volume in tons by far, still the raw commodities extracted from the earth and transported from one point to the other. These are the basic stuff from which everything else is made, and the basic stuff which still runs the engines of the world. Oil and gas, which are the blue segments there, this is the tonnage of the goods traveling on ships. And what are called the five main bulk cargoes, iron ore, coal, grains, bauxite or alumina, and phosphate, which is the browny beige bit above the blue. But manufactured goods matter, of course, too. Although the bit that shows the containers at the very top, the gray bit, seems much smaller in terms of tonnage, given that most likely it is manufactured goods, it will have higher value. Further, the whole point of containers is an increase in the density of the materials transported. More and more weight per volume, packed in ways that fewer people facilitate smaller volumes, moved over a vaster span of space in bigger ships in less time than before. Already in mid-19th century, Karl Marx was envisioning the spread of world markets connected through networks of production and webs of maritime and rail transport. In Grundrisse, he famously wrote, the more developed the capital, the more extensive the market over which it circulates, which forms the spatial orbit of its uh, circulation, the more does it strive simultaneously for an even greater extension of the market and for greater annihilation of space by time. And perhaps looking at the largest container ports in the world gives some indication of where the raw materials, in particular coal, oil, and iron ore, travel to and the finished products are loaded from. It is perhaps no surprise that, of the, that nine of the top ten, and the number ten is missing, I had to make sure that all of those fit. The nine of the top ten um, container ports in the world are located in China, Singapore, and Korea. What is perhaps more surprising is that Jabal Ali Dubai appears in the top 10 and that it is ahead as a container port and that it is ahead of the biggest European port, Rotterdam, by a couple of places. Rotterdam is, a, is the 11th container port, although it's ranked sixth in um, all cargo uh, beyond containers. And this is what I want to speak about today, the emergence of these ports in the Middle East. It is not surprising that the world's most significant and high volume oil terminals would be located in the Arabian Peninsula. Perhaps what needs explanation is something Rafif Ziade, uh, who I'm really excited to be working with on this project, pointed out to me the other day that all the glitzy development plans and development visions of all the countries of the Arabian Peninsula seem to have logistics as a pillar of their development plans for the near and medium term future. But we all know that the brilliance of plans and visions are not adequate ways of understanding the politics of something. That there are hidden or invisible structures, processes and constraints, unintended consequences and unforeseen obstacles, accidents, happenstance and conspiracies that all operate to throw a spanner in the machine of such planning. <clears throat> 
So for the remainder of this time, I want to talk about why I think the Middle East is so intensively focused on logistics today, but also what are the historical processes that have underwritten and continue to impel the building of ports and maritime infrastructures in the region. As I just mentioned, and as just Claire mentioned, uh, it's not surprising that the Arab... Uh, actually, Claire mentioned something else. As I just mentioned, it's not surprising that the Arabian Peninsula would be the main transport hub for export of oil, uh, for crude oil. As Claire mentioned, I was on a container ship, and I spent a lot of uh, time in the wheel room taking photographs of the radar screens because the route was really interesting to me. And... Um, the, this image is one I took on the recent trip from the radar screen in the wheel room. Our ship was steaming along the eastern coast of United Arab Emirates. So we're in the Gulf of Oman, and this is United Arab Emirates. And this dense concentration of triangles indicating ships is just outside of a port called Fajira. This density of ships at anchor waiting their turn to load petroleum products, because Fajira is primarily a chemical and petroleum product port, is apparently repeated all around the Arabian Peninsula. The International Energy Agency's statistics, it's this, it, this is an EIA slide, but it's based on International Energy Agency statistics, on the world's oil choke points are, of course, also indicative of the significance of the Arabian Peninsula, where the volume of oil transported is more than a third of the maritime oil supply in the world. The rest goes in pipelines or from other directions. But you can see how thick the line is leaving the Arabian Peninsula in various directions. But then the next question is, what accounts for Jabal Ali port being ranked in the top 10 container ports in the world, or the current emphasis on investing in other transshipment ports there? First, an explanation. What, what is transshipment? Some ports are transshipment ports, meaning that they act as a special kind of hub where much larger ships upload, uh, down, uh, unload goods that are then shipped on smaller vessels or other forms of transport, rail or trucks, to the surrounding regions. In this regard, Jabal Ali is fascinating. A bit more than 50% of all the goods passing through Jabal Ali are in fact transshipments. Not quite as high as Singapore, which the, where the percentage is 80%, but it's very high nevertheless. Given that the main trading partners for Dubai are China and India, one can assume that a significant percentage of the transshipment flows are from China to Dubai and from there to India, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and surrounding countries. One temptation, and a good one, is to think of these trade routes as a kind of echoes of the oceanic grooves of trade carved by the significant 19th century Indian Ocean ships a kind of ghostly permanence of route making in the sea itself. These routes are familiar routes, scented with spice and, odor, and, and odorous with debt bondage, slavery, and the depredations of various East India companies and so many other neocolonial companies involved in extraction and production and trade. But the story of the Indian Ocean trade of the 19th century is perhaps most significant to me because it is clear that since then, a great many ports in this corner of West Asia have fallen and a great many ports have risen in their places. And this is a great deal of the puzzle I'm trying to sort out to explain why Aden, Basra, and so many old and venerable Iranian ports have been replaced by ports in new places, Jabal Ali, Salala, Khor Fakhan, and so on. You can see from that image that the, 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 the Persian Gulf uh, landing points are all in northern Gulf rather than in southern Gulf, where now the biggest ports are. And here's a provisional answer that the geopolitics of war making has been crucial to the politics of capital accumulation in the Gulf. And both of these would have been impossible to imagine without the invisible sinews that connect the world together, that move the limbs of war and trade, the maritime trade in goods and raw materials. Wars are fought to protect trade routes, much of it maritime routes. International laws were first articulated by Grotius in justification of colonial control over maritime routes. 
Hydrographic charts and land maps were the necessary tools of the merchant and naval ships furrowing the sea. I spent a lot of time staring at admiralty charts, which are the currency of these container ship trips. They are still used extensively in these, current, uh, in these trips, and these admiralty charts were uh, first uh, produced by the hydrographic office of the admiralty as a means of imperial expansion, no, maritime ex imperial expansion for Britain. So much of what we pass over as the everyday furniture of our lives, our politics, our social relations, have their roots in this struggle over commercial and naval supremacy at sea. Historians of military logistics tell us that when armies moved across the surface of continents, they were often followed by crowds of roughly 50 to 150 per, uh, percent their size of people providing a whole range of logistical services to this moving army. Napoleon was so successful in the wars he fought, including those he fought against the British uh, in Egypt and Syria in the struggle over access to India, not only because he had a great strategic mind, but because he had at hand a formidable administrative apparatus that ensured supplies for his army were always there. In Europe, these supplies were not requisitioned forcibly uh, from the Europeans, as, was, as had been the common practice beforehand, but sent from behind the lines by the first ever instance of trains actually uh, uh, used for these purposes. In other locales, including Egypt and Syria, and later Russia, where Napoleon failed, his failure was as much a flaw in his logistical planning and enforceable requisitions and plunder of local goods needed to supply his army as the actual exigencies of battle. In fact, it was a Napoleonic innovation in European land wars to send commissionaries ahead of the military, in, uh, and I quote from a military historian, in order to organize the resources of this or that town and set up a market. And of course, on particular military trains, which was often fought over for permanent bases to be established. The diffusion and proliferation of roads and other means of transport, markets and civilian institutions have in the vast majority of instances gone hand in hand with war making. And the infrastructure of the market is also the same infrastructure used for war fighting. So wars, while destroying so much, have also been the underlying engine of economic and political transformations that are not always visible. Military historians, for example, trace the emergence of the vast network of railroads uh, f uh, across Western Europe. If you've ever gone into railing, you know you recognize what an amazing network it is. It actually goes back to the logistic lines that fed the different sides of European wars, often fought by the French and the Prussians as far back as Napoleon. The extensive highway systems that so characterizes transportation in the US has always had to do with the supply lines that fed and clothed the conquerors of indigenous lands there. And even today, the impetus for construction of new roads and highways, for example, comes from the necessary infrastructural support demanded by the defense and aerospace industries and the vast network of military and intelligence bases in that country, which is why if you've ever driven in the US, you recognize that the, the south in the US, where a lot of this defense and aerospace industry is concentrated, has some of the best roads in the nation. Aden and Basra became the significant ports that they did in the course of the 19th and early 20th century because they were not only transit points, entrepots, and transshipment ports for goods coming from India, but also because the British Empire's vast networks of naval hegemony and control required fuel, food, and supply way stations. That this still holds true has become clear to me in the course of my research thus far, only a few months into the project, and especially through the travels in the region. A look at the density of the ports today in the Arabian Peninsula shows the extent to which the growth of maritime transport infrastructure has had connections to war making. Of course, oil is a factor, but many of the ports highlighted above are not necessarily uh, primarily or even secondarily oil ports. A constant war economy since at least the 1950s has been crucial in reshaping the sector and the geography of the region. Think of the closures of the Suez Canal during the 1956 and again 1967 wars, the latter time for a total of eight years. 
That led to the economies of scale embodied in the super tankers that became so much of part of the trade in the region and which eventually, actually, the emergence of these super tankers became a significant factor in the growth uh, of the rocketing economies of Japan, Korea, and later China. Think of the anti-colonial insurgency in Aden that led to the British withdrawal from that corner of the Arabian Peninsula and the fall of Aden from its superior position as a merchant port when decolonization happened. Think of the US presence on the peninsula in Bahrain, Qatar, UAE, Oman, uh, secretly and privately in Saudi and in Yemen. Uh, and the role of U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the role that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has played in the construction of ports there, including managing the construction of Salala Port, which, as you saw on the list that I put up, is now one of the largest ports in the Middle East. Think of the shifts in finance and insurance from Beirut to the city-states of the Gulf during the Lebanese Civil War. Think of the manner in which Kuwait and Dubai became entrepôts for, Iran and, for Iraq and Iran, respectively, during the latter's long and devastating war in the 1980s. Think of the 1980s tanker wars in which the US hegemony in the Gulf was consolidated. And as Toby Jones has shown, formal US sovereignty was extended over crude tankers that were flagged to the US as if they were tiny fragments of US sovereign power floating in the Gulf. And of course, this declaration of sovereignty over uh, tankers was happening uh, exactly at the same time as the US merchant marine was being entirely disbanded with ships now flagged to other countries and especially to flags of convenience, which are registered in countries like Liberia, Panama, or Cyprus that obey few rules as far as labor conditions, environmental obligations, or other legal obligations were, cons uh, were um, considered. I myself was exposed to the intense embedding of ports and transport infrastructure in these imperial matrices of capital and coercion during my recent tra uh, trip on the container ship from Malta to Jabal Ali. This was an extraordinary experience. This was the ship I was on. Uh, 365 meters long, 50 meters wide, 290 meters, uh, 200 meters high. Uh, it's not 200 meters high. It's 90 meters high. Sorry. That would be pretty amazing. Um, this was an extraordinary experience in every way, and I've written about the, uh, the diaries out in my blog. But I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things that most struck me while steaming through the Arab Seas. The, this is the route that we took from Malta to Jabal Ali. These are Southern Mediterranean, Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden, Arabian Sea, the Gulf of Oman, and the Persian Gulf. And of course, uh, it was lovely and warm when you guys were having a really cold winter here. <laughs> On the one hand, this experience of annihilation of space by time was entirely real, however provisional, slow, and bounded it still is by constraints of politics, geopolitics, and geography. And what I want to do is I want to show you a little video of floating of the ship. And just to give you a sense, this is going through the Red Sea. And that sound is the sound of the engine. So you can see there is this kind of a slow movement, but the sea is completely full of container ships. There's something powerful, beautiful, uh, amazing, epic about this enormous ship um, moving through the sea at 23 knots, which anybody, I didn't know anything about what these speeds meant, but 23 knots is damn fast. On the other hand, time is still there. That clip was less than a minute long, and yet it felt really long. 
It, take, it takes time to move physical objects. It takes human beings to drive the trucks and operate the cranes and uh, drive the ships, at least in places where labor is still more plentiful or cheaper or more vulnerable to discipline and deportation, uh, which is why in Rotterdam, for example, Rotterdam is called a ghost port by the seafarers because almost everything in the, on the port side is, uh, including the trucks that are driving around, are automated. There are no humans driving them. But on the other hand, in the Middle East, they are still humans moving the containers. There's a person sitting in a crane way above this, directing the kind of a puzzle work that is required. This is going into the hole. There's ten layers of containers, and then eight layers above the hole. I just want you to hear the sound of it clinking. At the There was also, in addition to those containers, a couple of yachts being transported from, uh, from, I think, Germany to China, where apparently there is a huge market now for luxury yachts. Uh, the, the main uh, item being transported, based on uh, the number of refrigerated containers in there, seem to be chemicals. <coughs> So uh, what was incredibly striking was the physicality, the materiality of maritime commerce. Second, what was striking was the extent of the security seas. I was expecting to see uh, pirate ships in the pirate waters of Gulf of Aden. There was even a frisson of danger, thinking about pirate skiffs trying to intercept us, some adventures. I even wrote out a kind of a will saying, if I get captured, <laughs> Who should take care of my mortgage? <laughs> Instead, I'm serious. Instead, what I found was the extent to which, in fact, the prevalent kind of non-merchant ships on these waters are warships, and they're everywhere. The French aircraft carrier Charles de Gaulle was on its way to the Gulf there, and it actually identified itself to our ships and warned that there might be uh, naval planes flying overhead. But so were a dozen other anonymous gray warships of various sorts, often dwarfed in size by the massive container ships passing them by. They often cloaked themselves with no identifying information sent out, no flags, nothing that said where they were coming from. And on the little screen which shows the name of the ships, it was either not showing anything at all or it was blank. And the only way that you could tell there were warships, of course, the seafarers knew them all, but it was also they had these numbers on the side, which I wrote down. And the, sh and, and the ships that we passed uh, included Dutch, Italian, Indian, and Chinese warships. The route uh, was similarly militarized. Uh, what was amazing, perhaps the most amazing bit of the trip, other than arriving in the ports, was going through the Suez Canal. And I had been on land side on Suez Canal, but never actually going through it. And what really struck me was that the entire length of the Suez Canal on the African side are layer upon layer of militarization. So this is the view. The canal is just here. There are sand berms all the way along. There are roads. That, the, that only the military vehicles can take. And then there's that wall, which is incredibly quite high, and intercepted every kilometer by a watchtower, which were manned, and so I didn't dare photograph them. There are watch posts and outposts everywhere. <laughs> 
And the ports themselves were also variously uh, securitized. Some were more relaxed than others. But at Jabal Ali, for example, what I was really struck by was that the, where the ship's berth on the side of the port is actually separated by a security gate. So anybody coming off the ship cannot get into the port proper. They can only stay in that berth area. And in order for them to get in there, they have to go through a gate which has an electronic identification security thing on it. The third thing that struck me was the extent to which the destinations of shipping companies are bound up with not only complex commercial calculations, but also nationalist and geopolitical ones. Alliances between shipping companies seem to follow interesting geopolitical alignments. CMACGM, the shipping company that I took, which is a French shipping company owned by a Franco-Syrian family with connections still to Syria and Lebanon, is in an alliance with the United Arab Shipping, which was once based in Kuwait and is now in the UAE. And that says something also about the movement of capital in the Gulf itself. And their third partner was a major sh uh, Chinese shipping firm. The geography of these alliances itself is pregnant with stories of war, movement, and commerce. And today, these alliances influence which ports are visited, which routes are selected, which commercial deals are entered into. There's so much more that I can say, but we're running out of time here. In this long lecture, one significant element has been missing. And that element is the bodies that are necessary to the working of the machine. They are the seafarers, dockers, port workers, construction laborers, and millions of others who make the movement of ships and of goods across the sea possible. I began with Melville's Moby Dick. Melville is remarkable not only for his powerful and beautiful rendering of life at sea, but also for his sympathy for mutineers and slave revolts. But I want to instead invoke his enigmatic story, Bartleby the Scrivener, as I close this lecture. In that story, a frail man working in a dreary legal office one day decides to refuse. He simply, undramatically refuses. I prefer not to. And his quiet, enigmatic repudiation shifts something in the fundaments of his world. Something imperceptibly changes. In Deborah Cowan's great recent book, The Deadly Life of Logistics, she speaks of the possible quote unquote, disruption to the commodity flows that labor mobilization can affect, of chokeholds that are not just geographical, but human, and that can become sites of resistance to the ceaseless grind of capital and violence. In my obsession with Melville, and as I read Cowan's book, and now as I wind up this lecture, I could not but think of Bartleby in the humdrum every day of his ordinary life, Living a monotonous and precarious life, the hyper-managerialized, securitized, bureaucratized capital demands of us, entangled as we are in sinews of war and trade, and I could not help but think of his refusal again and again. I prefer not to. Thank you very much. Well, I feel very privileged to stand before you on this stage to honor and thank Lali Khalili. Although I don't speak any Farsi, I do know the meaning of June. Lali June, you are the Juniest. <laughs> I will have a few things to say about Lali's magnificent contributions to scholarship, but let me start with a more personal reflection about how we forged our doppelganger bond through our shared fascination with some of the very worst uh, kinds of things that humankind is capable of. Now, while that might sound like a grim homage, I love Lolly for loving to hate the things that I love to hate. Torture, war, military occupation, targeted killing, and so on. We are weirdly and fabulously connected and energized by these shared interests. Now, our doppelganger connection has a history. The first few times I met Lali, who's much, much younger than I am, um, were at MESA meetings, that's Middle East Studies Association. And our encounters were fleeting, the kind one has at, at academic conferences. And each time, it seemed, she had a beautiful, then toddler in tow. First her first, her wondrous daughter, May, 
and then her son Pablo, <clears throat> named for the poet laureate of the world, Pablo Neruda. As I said, those were fleeting encounters. In 2009, I was on sabbatical and I was roving around Europe uh, looking for people who were working on American torture in the war on terror. Um, and one of my scheduled stops was London. Now, I knew that Lale was following a similar research trajectory to me at the time, and we'd interviewed some of the same people. We were researching the same things, Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo, CIA black sites, British complicity with American torture, and so on. So I was eager to compare notes with her. But I did not really know Lali. So I emailed, sorry, emailed her and said um, I would be coming to London and would she like to meet for drinks or a coffee? Um, her reply was to ask me where I was staying. So I thought she was looking for a logistical uh, answer to where we might meet. <laughs> but I didn't actually have a place uh, in London at the time. I hadn't yet made a reservation. Um, and so uh, she, to make a long story short, she said, why don't you stay with me? And I said, OK. So I, <laughs> so I spent five days at her place with her, John, and the kids. And in those five days, I fell in love with Lolly. What a mind, what principles, what humor and cynicism, what insights and irreverence, and what an awe-inspiring work ethic. Indeed, at night, we would sit around. I would watch Law & Order uh, reruns, and she would be <laughs> pumping new info into Gulf 2000. <laughs> and perhaps to people who are not like Lolly or me, spending hours or days, actually, talking about torture and prisons and war crimes would sound depressing. But for us, for Lali and me, it was exhilarating, illuminating, doppelgangering. I had found my intellectual soulmate. In the following few years, Lali's life changed dramatically. In those years of transformation and to some degree turmoil, Lali produced Time in the Shadows. That book, I can say without the slightest bit of exaggeration, is a tour de force. If you don't own a copy, you should run, not walk, uh, to a bookstore to buy it. Time in the Shadows blends a historiography of counterinsurgency war warfare across many continents and eras, an ethnography of military detention and a comparative analysis of prisoner abuse, and a political economy of confinement operations. There is quite literally no better book on any of the topics she addresses. So how does Alale follow a showstopper like Time in the Shadows? Her next act was intended to be an intermission of sorts, a break from torture and war. Lolly decided to embark on a study of pleasure. Sounds fun, right? Well, happily for me, the pleasure she wanted to study was concentrated in Beirut, where, as happenstance would have it, I had lined up a job as a visiting professor at the American University of Beirut which I'm now back at. In September of 2012, as I was moving to Beirut to take up my AUB gig, and she was looking for pleasure, we overlapped. <laughs> and we continued to do so as she made research trips to town on weeks when she wasn't with her lovely kids, May and Pablo. I will be eternally grateful that Lali bequeathed to me her Beirut posse of friends. Her friends, now my friends, would wait her periodic visits as a perfect excuse to throw raucous Lollipalooza parties. <laughs> During that period, Lolly was frequenting the lefty bars in the Palestinian camps, the women-only beaches, and the shisha cafes to understand how people experience and understand pleasure and happiness. And watching her work was another life lesson for me. Lolly was working on pleasure at an especially unpleasurable moment when friends and allies, her friends and allies and research subjects were riven and alienated by conflicts racking Syria, Lebanon, and Palestine. <clears throat> but studying, analyzing, and theorizing pleasure was her task. So to do so, she let herself revel in all the poets and social theorists of pleasure and its contexts. In that transitional project, she unleashed her ferocious imagination. She let it off the chain. She theorized practice, pleasure as practice, as collective affect, as an economy of joy and its counterparts in suffering and disappointment. And those grounded revelations about a topic as elusive as pleasure, I believe, led her to conceive of her current adventure, the sea. Lali has set her sights on the infrastructures and trajectories of the world at sea um, and, the, and the world of the seas. And she has regaled us tonight with a taste of salt water and sea air filtered through the eyes and minds of a brilliant observer of too often ignored phenomena. Uh, 
Now, I would bet that we, all of us in this room, and those of you watching later on YouTube, will never again see a container ship without thinking, Lale taught me how to see that. Lale, you make the world you study as you study the world. You are a poet, a political economist, an historian, an ethnographer, a philosopher, a traveler, a joker, a mother, a lover, a friend. You're a beautiful human being with an awe-inspiring intellect. Now, when I was invited by Lali to give this thank you address, or I guess it's called vote of thanks, I joked that I would thank her for being part of my torture-focused world, and then I would wail, why did you leave me for the sea? Uh, but having read her blogs and heard her address tonight, I see the continuities of interests, thoughts, and theories. She weaves threads of the world, empirical, imperial, and literary threads, masterfully refashioned into original thought, and I am humbled again. Thank you, Lali June. And now before we go up to Lali Palooza London style, let's all give it up big time for Professor Lali Khalil.